caring about the Vienna Werkstatt and how it originated because it was all about the making, it was all about the workshops, it was all about the craft, it was hugely inspirational because um, it completely transformed and gave me a different perspective. The sewing table. I'm particularly fascinated uh, with this object and the fact that you know this activity seems to not be relevant almost to, uh, to today. And, and what's interesting is um, the combination of all this kind of hard elements or hard materials together with the softness of what it holds on the inside. You know the grid um, reference which surrounds uh, this. Uh, fabric element on the inside, I think, is, uh, is really particularly um, an interesting tension. I position this piece on spheres, an exaggerated element of something that could have been also the design of that time, because you can see the sphere element, whether it's a full sphere or a half a sphere, appearing um, in a lot of, of the furniture of the time. Usually they're much smaller. So the exaggeration of that creates this tension of instability. It's almost like this idea of a movable object. And then a little bit you know, further to the front, you see this gesture of this reflective surface, almost like a drop of mercury that um, seems to have ended up on the surface by accident. And I think this is a great addition. Uh, you know, having the, the, the pieces, uh, the Lohmeyer pieces in there. Uh, playing. I'd like to highlight what is happening over here, which I find particularly fascinating, starting from the tool box, the, the cabinet. Um, it's a complete uh, contrast to the finished objects that surround this piece, but it's actually what the whole um, spirit of the Wiener Werkstatt was all about, you know, the craft and the making and this incredible collection of tools, you know, in the roughness, um, surrounded in the roughness of the box, very beautifully displayed, the, the big sphere in front of it, again, as a reference, uh, a glowing sphere to um, highlight uh, that particular object. The sphere is obviously part of this uh, oversized um, mobile uh, chandelier um, that creates that space and that relationship. It's somewhere right behind the cabinet is the um, shoes, this dress shoes, highlighting obviously uh, a code that was quite kind of formal because it was all about performance. I think it's interesting to talk about this um, wall um, cabinet. One of them is a wall clock, and this one is a, a storage uh, unit uh, that is normally meant to position against the wall. And if you see, uh, the surface at the back is never finished, so it's actually left in its raw uh, state, highlighting the material that is, was actually made. Um, it was only natural for me to dress these surfaces in mirror uh, to create that illusion effect um, and, 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 and create that playfulness uh, between uh, the reflections of objects. Uh, in this particular case, it highlights the back of a chair, um, which you wouldn't see uh, in normal circumstances, and also uh, creating this tension between the image, the chair itself, and the light that is beautifully framed um, around the motif uh, on the back. Um, the chair is uh, sitting on stills. It's the extension of their own legs, so bringing the importance of quite a utilitarian uh, piece of furniture. Always 
being about the reflection of light, you know, and having these elements of, uh, of experiencing that. Can you tell us about your origins and how you came to, uh, in contact with the design? I grew up in Cyprus, a uh, very small island in the Mediterranean, and, uh, and felt always quite kind of limited in terms of my environment. Obviously, um, all my upbringing uh, was very much influenced uh, from local uh, uh, people. Um, that uh, the exposure to the outside only happened through traveling. Um, because also Cyprus didn't have a university at the time. It was normal that everybody had to go abroad if they were to pursue further studies. So I decided to kind of go to England. And even though I always wanted to do something creative, my parents didn't feel that this was going to give me a job. So I went and uh, studied engineering uh, at Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine and then eventually uh, discovered uh, the Royal College of Art and uh, discovered design and uh, after finishing my studies I decided to uh, continue further and, uh, and study design and this is what really my first experience other than really and in terms of understanding what the um, academic meaning of design and how you could become a designer was. Much later on I realized that probably this was not needed and even mm -hmm. looking around in your immediate environment was more than enough to really understand where your, uh, where design, uh, the, the design origins should be. But it was obviously an incredible exposure um, into the history of design which was really important. Have you already dealt with the Wiener Werkstätte before this exhibition assignment? The Wiener Werkstätte has always been uh, uh, a very influential period uh, for um, my uh, design learning, my design education. Uh, what was interesting at the time when I was studying design at the Royal College, uh, the normal um, of what was expected from designers after they would graduate is that they would work with different manufacturers and, um, and then sell their ideas and then eventually start working with them. But it wasn't so much focused on the actual craft and the actual making of it. And so suddenly hearing about the Wiener Werkstatt and how it originated, because it was all about the making, it was all about the workshops, it was all about the craft, it was hugely inspirational because um, it completely transformed and gave me a different perspective. I, the early years uh, after my graduation, I used them as researching what I wanted design to be. And much later on, when I realized that entering in this circle of working uh, with established companies and brands, um, was not an option for everybody because everybody wants to work with somebody that is famous. So at that time, being a student, you couldn't be famous. Uh, it, was, uh, it was impossible almost. So a few years later, I decided to, to, um, to start from the object itself. And I said, why am I waiting for this opportunity to come from somebody else to offer it to me? I need to do it myself. And so the Vienna Werkstatt was a great example because um, that, that's when I decided to uh, go into um, um, production of, um, of my own designs. And, um, uh, and that was the period also, the Vienna Werkstatt, when, when things started from the actual uh, craft of making. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, yeah, and in what way did the Wiener Werkstatt affect your own work uh, precisely? <laughs> you know, the, uh, I always identified myself as a modernist. Um, and I think it took quite a few years to really relate. But I, even though I loved um, a lot of other um, influences, obviously, in design, but mm -hmm. I always went back to modernism because that's where the, the true beginning of design was. Um, and uh, 
Therefore, you know, all these figures uh, from that period are hugely inspirational because um, the, uh, the, the, the source comes from reduction, you mm -hmm. know, reducing down to the, uh, the bare elements and the essentials, really. It's very structured, it's very disciplined, and it appeals greatly to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the Wiener Werkstätte was strongly influenced by arts and crafts, uh, as well as the Glasgow Four. Do these Art Nouveau trends um, matter in your work also? Or? Mm -hmm. All these periods, you know, everything was seen to be happening around the same time. And, um, and if you look at Europe, you know, and all these different movements, obviously under a different name and with a slightly um, you know, different approach, I would say, uh, seemed to be addressing the same issue. You know, it felt almost like a revolution. You know, it was the start, the real start of modernism. And, um, and you know, all these uh, periods seemed to kind of overlap and coincide. Yes, there was there were different approaches, I think, and and uh, different uh, of course. language of of, of course the, the approach mm. was very different, mm. but they were all um, reacting against something, yeah. and this is what was very important. But somehow, it's interesting to understand that this this reaction was all happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. But I think there's they're all linked in some way, even yes. though the, the 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 style I would say is very very different but uh, somehow um, there is a relationship there. And yeah. I think the time period is probably what connects them mm. uh, most and creates, you know, that, uh, that reaction. Yeah. yeah, which of the exhibited objects would you like to transform within your work and how would you proceed? I read in an interview, um, th um, you said the new doesn't exist, Creating means trans transformation, so there is nothing new, you mean, or...? It, it's, um, it's true, I really strongly believe that. I feel that um, originality uh, in that sense and, and, and the, the, that sense of new ideas and what is new uh, is not really new. It's a reintroduction of something and a reinterpretation of something that has already existed in the past. It's impossible to claim fame uh, for something, uh, for a new creation in that way. Because if you look at the history, you will somehow, somewhere at a different time, um, find the reference. And maybe it doesn't come out in the, exactly the same form, it doesn't come out in exactly the same medium, but the idea is the same. And, and, and it's interesting because to look at all these movements, uh, throughout the design history is that you can see also the references before them. So even the Wiener Werkstatt it was not, um, you know, of course it was revolutionary in terms of what, what it was doing, but somehow the ideas existed in yes. the past. And, yeah. and even these, the, their creators uh, um, borrowed these ideas and reinterpreted yeah. them mm. in that way. So uh, going back to your question, the choice would be really very difficult. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by the beauty, I'm overwhelmed by the excitement of these pieces, but one particular um, family, I think, of objects would be the grid objects, mm -hmm. uh, because um, I love the um, uh, obsessiveness, you know, how obsessive and, and that language, that vocabulary translated into all these objects. For me, this, this was uh, fascinating. So, and it feels that there's so much more you could say with them. So I would love to uh, be able to contribute uh, to this family if I had the opportunity, because there seems to be a, a, almost like a system um, that yes. somehow gets translated and, and interpreted in, in so many different ways and, and, and it feels that there's so many other opportunities. It's almost like a, um, uh, that they are derived from a mathematical formula, that they are not really um, just spontaneous creative pieces. There seems to be that there is a certain structure, a certain methodology and, and, and a sequence that you follow, almost like a mathematical sequence, 
And, uh, and this is why I find the grid objects uh, particularly fascinating. Great. I'm really looking forward for this transformation of the grid objects. <laughs> I hope I have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to find the, the grid um, as a yeah, material, as yeah. a starting point. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, uh, they're, they're all be very, very beautiful. Yes. And it's, um, it's incredible to see them. And obviously, um, uh, you know, every time I discover a new one, I, um, you know, it makes me smile. Mm -hmm. because I can almost position it somewhere within that formula. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, um, you are working together with Art Nouveau traditional companies like Lobmeyer and Tornet. You are sitting on your uh, design for Tornet Vienna. Um, how can we depict uh, these collaborations? Um, are they approaching you uh, with certain ideas or...? Um. I always felt very, very drawn by, you know, from history. So for me, the idea that these companies actually exist today is um, what, uh, you know, uh, makes me really excited. You know, the uh, ability to even tap into that history. You know, had the Wiener Werkstatt exist today, and I would have loved to be uh, part of it. And it's interesting because these companies carry almost that, uh, that, that tradition uh, to today. I mean, with the presence of uh, the reissuing of all these historical pieces, which are very much relevant even today, you know, that they still look so beautiful and so contemporary yeah. uh, in their own way. So um, th this opportunity to, uh, to be invited to be part um, of the, their um, designers um, is, is really um, a great privilege and both Tony and also um, Lobmeyer uh, have given me that, uh, that opportunity. Um, it's, it's important to really understand their history and their positioning um, through that period and, and this is what's really fascinating and I think is a um, an, an exciting opportunity to be able to, to tap into that history and also uh, learn uh, very much about their real craft and, and, and where the core um, of these uh, companies and how they were, um, um, how they originated, how they were structured. And um, how was the contact? Uh, they ask you to, to design they, anything? Um, or? It's a flirting game, you know, you, mm -hmm. um, I always felt very attracted to these uh, companies, you know, the idea that, as I said, exist, they existed uh, still today was almost like um, an impossibility for me because I thought that I would, uh, I would dream to be able to uh, be given that opportunity. As I was saying to you, uh, unfortunately, um, it's very difficult to make that step and who makes the step first usually mm -hmm. it's a flirting game so yeah. that you have to start and initiate with these companies and 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 this is what very much happened i met leonid uh, the owner of dob meyer at a dinner um, in new york in mm -hmm. uh, 2008 if i remember oh. correctly and, um, and we were sitting uh, across each other. Um, um, I told him how, how fascinated that I was with, uh, about the pieces. So he was quite kind of intrigued by the conversation. And then a couple of years later on, we met again um, and, uh, and, and we agreed that it would be uh, a great idea if we were about to explore something uh, together. And, um, and so I, I went uh, back to him with a proposal. The first piece that I designed was the um, light called Captured. And, and that was the first piece we, we developed, which is still, you know, even um, produced by them today. Um, and then, of course, that dialogue and that conversation, that relationship sort of continued. Uh, even on a friendly basis, and uh, and then we produced even uh, more pieces like the uh, flint, um, mm -hmm. the tumbler that yeah. is uh, right behind me. <laughs> um, the same with uh, with uh, with Tone, um, which 
is uh, Gebrüder Donewe, uh, Austrian uh, uh, company originally, but now um, owned and based in Turin, in Italy. Uh, but still, the tradition is, is uh, the same, the history is the same, so that, uh, that idea of working with them um, came about uh, from uh, the actual CEO of the company that um, uh, I was introduced to, who invited me to, uh, to explore what I could say with this uh, somehow um, in this vocabulary. It is a vocabulary again. It's the same vocabulary yeah. that we talked about, yes. the grid objects, mm -hmm. you know, how mm -hmm. far and what can you do, uh, which is different in Bentwood uh, furniture. That the technique that you know was had its explosion, uh, its explosion so many uh, you know over hundred years ago. So, yeah. Where do you wish to see your work in hundred years? It's a bit difficult, I think. But <laughs> perhaps you have an idea. It's it's fascinating because uh, my experience uh, in the Mac and understanding uh, the importance um, of uh, all this archive in a museum and, um, and what, does, what is the modern meaning of the museum, what will be these future uh, collections of the museum. I have the privilege um, to have a few pieces of mine as part of the, my collection from my previous exhibition, um, as well as some other pieces that uh, slowly sort of uh, enter the collection. And it's, um, it's, it's so exciting to uh, think that uh, perhaps in a hundred years time that people will uh, look at your own objects um, perhaps not with the same importance but um, equally they would be you know historical pieces because so much time would have passed so it's it's amazing because the whole success of a design object is, is when it survives time mm -hmm. for me. And, and, and this is um, uh, really uh, fascinating to understand what makes a timeless object, what yeah. makes an object relevant. Because sometimes in a historical collection, especially in a museum collection, you can find some crazy experiments that happened in history. But how relevant are they to our lives? Uh, today is always the question, but some of them are um, they only manage to, to remain as a time capsule where some others transcend that and they become uh, timeless and they become relevant uh, to the way that we live. Mm -hmm.